uh, I can't resist the opportunity to talk just a little bit about Episcopal schools and some things that you may not know about the Episcopal school world. First of all, that in the nine provinces of the Episcopal Church, there are over a thousand schools. Many of those are early childhood programs, but uh, in this part of the world, for instance, in uh, Fairfield and Westchester County, uh, predominance of early childhood programs. You go a little further north in New England and you'll find a lot of boarding schools. A lot of people think that Episcopal schools are all in the Northeast. Well, the reality is the largest number of them in any state right now is in Texas, uh, followed by Florida, and then California. And the largest diocese of the nine provinces in terms of Episcopal schools is the Diocese of Haiti, which has 254 schools. It also happens to be the largest diocese in our church right now. And we have about 60 of our members' schools that have partnership programs with schools in Haiti. It's one of the more exciting things that we're involved with. Um, a lot of people also assume that these are highly elite institutions. And the reality is that our schools are as diverse or even more diverse than their public school counterparts. And that the fastest growing number of our schools right now are the tuition-free urban schools that are being founded and are popping up in places as diverse as Philadelphia, Hartford, Tucson, Arizona, Denver, Boston, Lawrence, Massachusetts. And these are schools that rely on no money from the church. None of our schools really rely on any money from the church or the diocese. And they raise every penny that they spend. And this is a small uh, trend to the contrary of what's happened in our country in the past 10, 15 years where over a half a million young people have lost their faith-based urban schools due to closures, mostly Roman Catholic schools. So that's a little bit of what we do. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, not too long ago, I was preaching at a high school chapel in Houston, Texas, where there were 700 students in attendance. Obviously, they were, had to be there. It was a compulsory chapel. <laughs> But I thought to myself, where else would you see 700 teenagers going to church under one roof? It speaks of the tremendous opportunity that we have in Episcopal schools. You might be interested to know as well that only about 20% uh, churchwide of the students in Episcopal schools are in fact Episcopalian. Uh, and we have a great many Roman Catholic families and a great many families who come from no tradition at all. So that's a little bit about Episcopal schools. Happy to talk, answer more questions about that. Anytime today we talk about spirituality, I think we have to put it in the larger framework of what is happening religiously in our country today. Because it is a pretty phenomenal thing what is going on in our country. You may know, for instance, that the largest religious, so to speak, group in our country are those now who have no tradition at all, who claim no tradition. They may be religious people. They may say they're spiritual, but not religious. But that is the largest number. And in all of our Episcopal schools, we're finding an increasing number of those families and their children present. 30% of those who affiliate with a religious tradition in this country have at one point changed religions. Uh, our religious landscape today is marked by a great deal of fluidity and a great deal of free choice. For instance, probably uh, those percentages are mirrored in the presidential campaigns and the religious lives of many of our candidates for president right now. Uh, an example, Marco Rubio, Bobby Jindal, and Jeb Bush all have at least once changed religious traditions, very much reflective of what is going on in this country. And when it comes to dramatic change that is going on, of course, we can point to an ever-increasing religious diversity in our culture. We can also point to increasingly, sadly, uh, a growth in religious literacy. 
or gross and religious illiteracy. More and more people know less and less about religious traditions. And I would venture to ask you, how can we be responsible global citizens today if we do not understand uh, many of the ma major world traditions, religiously speaking? This is one of the tremendous opportunities that Episcopal schools have. And so many of our chaplains are working with a population that is highly reflective of the religious landscape in this country. At a recent gathering of our school chaplains, a professor at Duke University was there and talked about the fact that you, the chaplains, are on the front lines working with people that the church spends a lot of time fretting about how to reach. That great unchurched group, so to speak. There are tremendous opportunities. Likewise, the, the opportunity to study religion, Bible, ethics, world religions. We have an, an extraordinarily unique opportunity in Episcopal schools, but we also have a very important role to play in terms of cultivating and educating global citizens today. So I could talk lots about those things, but we, we really have great opportunities in our school communities to uh, be reaching people that we might not otherwise be reaching. A Couple of things I do not want to do today. The first one is I'm not about trashing high achieving people or the, the motivation to achieve. I think that is one of the things that keeps our lives full, abundant, exciting. So I, I, I'm not going to start by saying we should downplay high achieving. And in our schools, we encourage that, we celebrate that. Uh, I'll put a little addendum to that in a second. But I'm not about talking about um, what's wrong with high achievement. Like anything, it comes at a cost. Anything we realize as we grow into adulthood comes at a cost. So the pressure to achieve does indeed come at a cost, but in and of itself, um, I don't think we should be disparaging. Another thing I wanted to raise as a question to you, which in many cases when we talk about spirituality today, it seems to be a given that everybody accepts or everyone works toward. And that is the notion of balance. We all want balance in our lives and we're very easy at beating up ourselves about not having that balance. I'm wondering if there is such a thing as balance in our lives. Is that something we can achieve? Perhaps. I think there is a tendency today that when we think of balance, we equate that with doing it all. And I don't think we can do that. But I'm simply going to raise the question that uh, when we think about alternatives to our hurried, pressured lives today, oftentimes we will think of balance as the option. And I'm not so certain about balance. Uh, I don't know if we can have balanced lives. But what the content of our lives is may not necessarily be about balance. So the first thing I'd like to talk about today is the formula for high achievement. Because I think the problem today, and as we try to make spiritual sense of achievement in our communities, in our churches, in our own personal lives, is not the notion of achievement, not the notion of ambition, but the formula we might have in mind. And by that, I mean, I see a lot of instances where young people today are indeed achieving at extraordinary levels, but are locked into a, a singular formula for what that means. So the problem might not rest with high achievement. It might rest with the specific, isolated, one and only formula that we offer for achievement. Many of you might have seen quite a sobering article that is in the December issue of Atlantic Monthly about the high school in Palo Alto, California, which is certainly a bastion for high achievement, but also at the same time 
is a place that is grappling with the proliferation of young people killing themselves. And if you read that article, which indeed is a sobering read, one of the senses at least I got from it was that these are young people which are operating with a solitary formula for success and the need to measure up to that. So perhaps the issue is not so much achievement, but the solitary avenue toward achievement. The solitary script, if you will, for getting ahead or doing well. And that what we can do with young people and in our own lives and in our communities is to be talking about what are the variety of ways that we achieve and pride ourselves on that achievement. Because hopefully, there is more than one way to achieve. Second thing I think, think about is, uh, in high achieving communities, the dirtiest word, of course, is failure. And if you ask many of our teachers in Episcopal schools what most concerns them today, most likely they will talk about parents who cannot bear watching their children go through s s failures or setbacks or difficult experiences. But we all know, and in making spiritual sense of our lives, we all know that we learn the most from our failures. Those are the most instructive things in our lives. That's why not too long ago in advice to employers, David Brooks in the New York Times advised employers to look for those people, believe it or not, whose resumes reflect a setback and that they have sprung back from that setback, that they have traveled in some way the way of suffering. Those are people who are gonna make the best employees of anyone who have fallen that lonely, difficult path in some way of a suffering or a setback. In our schools today, we talk more and more, thankfully, about the notion of resilience. And that has to do with how we bounce back from a setback. And I was thinking about this not too long ago. I had a conversation with a former student of mine when I was the upper school head at St. Albans in Washington, D.C. And as upper school head, you had to preside over unpleasant things like discipline, suspensions, and every once in a while, an expulsion. And this was a young man I was having a conversation with who is now about 30 years old. If you talked about a person who had led a charmed life, he certainly has. His last name would be recognized pretty immediately by almost everyone. He went through St. Albans, he went to a very, very good school, uh, college, he has a good job, he has a wonderful family, and his future looks very, very bright. But in his senior year at school, uh, he came before the Honor Council for an infraction, which landed him with a suspension, as well as he had to give up the class office that he had. And many, many years later, a few weeks ago, he told me that a single day does not pass, that he does not go back to that experience during his senior year in high school. I thought, well, I wonder why that is. Maybe he still feels guilty about it. <laughs> Maybe he's got some lingering anger that he wants to direct my way. And so I asked him, why is that? And he says, because it helps remind me of the fragility of life and the fact that we learn more from those kinds of experiences than any other. So I want to hold out the notion of the educative spiritual value of setbacks and failures and the need we have to allow our young people to experience that. More and more uh, college psychological counselors will talk about a, a number of things, but one of them is 
the numbers are overwhelming of people who need their services today. But also they'll talk about the increasing uh, evidence they see of young people who have more and more difficult times navigating relatively small setbacks or difficult experiences. And that suggests to me that we really haven't spent enough time preparing young people or even allowing young people those kinds of experiences. Another thing that uh, I would like to pose as a challenge to us is what are we willing to walk away from in our lives? What are we willing to surrender, to set aside for a moment? What are those things that we feel truly locked into that we have preciously little control over? Now, for many people today, that answer would come in the form of technology. It doesn't have to be that, though. But what are the things that we actually, in our lives, have the freedom to set aside? Not permanently, uh, but at important moments, what are we able to set aside, to walk away from for a short period of time, if nothing else? Because I think that is about freedom. And it is at the root of the gospel message about freedom, our capacity to, if even for a very short time, to surrender something. What are we willing to do? Or what do we feel we can do? And then the final notion, and I want to make certain we've got some time for questions is the notion of presence. And to, uh, in the spirit of the season, to talk about presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, as opposed to P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E presence as opposed to presence. One person defined presence as the meeting ground for our outward appearance, and our inner conviction. And the need we have for more of what I would call presence in the world today. To be in the midst of a place, to be in the midst of those we love, to be in the presence of God, and less about the things or the lists that clutter our minds and hearts. What are the things that we need to be present for? And what are the who are the people that we need truly to be present with? These are some of the things that I think about. Um, I don't think there is necessarily uh, a sort of a, um, a mutual exclusion of spirituality and religion. Um, we hear many people, an increasing number of young people today, saying, well, I'm spiritual but not religious. But I think there is, in the component of religious belief and practice and accountability, an element of community that is missing from simply isolated spirituality. And at the same time, spirituality and those who talk about being spiritual have a lot to teach our religious institutions today. So, uh, in a nutshell, that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, obviously, it's in very broad strokes, uh, but I uh, wanted to leave time for some questions and uh, reactions, things I said as well as did not say. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on what the balance is possible between the right thing to be Something that's very much kind of talked about. Oh, yes. About and so forth. Well, I think we all gain a lot of satisfaction, a lot of nurturing from uh, putting ourselves wholeheartedly into some things. And at the same time, we get very upset with ourselves in thinking that we're not tending to other things. 
And the kind of perfect balance that we envision for ourselves, I think, is something that we are good at using against ourselves. And I don't think there's anything wrong with balance, but I think it, it is used as a kind of a weapon we use against ourselves, thinking it's got to be that way. And I'm not sure it has to be that way, to find the kind of spiritual fulfillment and sort of counterbalance, if you will, to all of the many demands of life. And how do we find that spiritual nurturing in the midst of those demands? But I'm not convinced, I don't know if I've given an adequate answer there, I'm not convinced that the notion of balance uh, is particularly helpful for our lives. Uh, because it suggests something that I'm not sure we can do. Oh. What do you think? Well, is the answer to that so you kind of have to pick and choose them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And again, part of the, the whole surrendering thing is what are the things that we're just going to have to give up? But the, the equation of balance with being able to do it all, I think, is where we run into real trouble. But, yes. Yep. Yeah. There were years when I was working hard in my life. I'm not working hard enough. <laughs> so, so go figure. Yeah. Um, I also had a question, you know, my, I have a daughter who you know, aspires to be a doctor, but you know, you know, she's a scientist and everybody, that's how she does it. Yeah. Yeah. Could you, could, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, didn't she, she aspires to be a doctor, she's a fantastic young woman, but you know, she tells me she's a scientist, so she doesn't believe she's like, I can't believe God, I'm a scientist. And I'm like, what? what? There are many scientists who believe in God. I know, I said, I said that, I said that. Beauty of Even science and evidence. Yeah. 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 Just from the very brief scenario you gave, um, I don't think that's necessarily a permanent um, uh, conclusion. I think uh, it may well suggest that at the moment she is working with an image out there of what it means and what it doesn't mean, and that that's more important than where she fits into the whole thing. Um, I, and I would not at all underestimate the power and the influence of you being a believing person that in the long run that will have on her. But um, uh, young people are classic in their uh, desire to look at a, a formula out there and say, that's it, that's what I should be, with all of the accompanying trappings. And that, you know, that may well be something of what's going on there, that it, you, you, I can't be a scientist and be a believer. Um, I work with high school students in this community, and I'm increasingly a little bit discouraged about yes. this kind of idea of the perfect balance and who dies with the most toys wins, and I have to do this laundry list to be able to go to this school. To be. And I, I, I'm just curious, kind of your suggestions, or you know, the community as parents of younger children who eventually will follow that same path that I can so many do. You know. How do we push them in another direction, possibly? But let them know that there is not one. There are so many. Yep. Um, one is we, we have to accept the reality that out there, um, and, and part of growing up is this single-minded notion that this is how it should be, and therefore I've got to follow that path. Um, I think one of the valuable things we can do with young people, whether they're our own children or we're working with them, is to be able to spot areas that we sense they are good at, that may lie around the margins of their notion of success, 
and to point out that they're really a fuller person than what that scenario might suggest or require. Uh, I, I think that is, I can't underestimate our capacity with our students or our children to be able to say, you know, you're really good at that. Um, and, and to point out that, that we're richer individuals, we've got deeper and fuller internal lives than what the success scenario may indicate. And to, uh, that's one thing I would think of, to, to be on the lookout for that sort of thing. I often think of the, that wonderful compendium of beautiful values called Desiderata. Mm -hmm. Are most people, are you familiar with that? A little bit, a little bit. Um, and it, it, although it, I don't think it really mentions spirituality, it was found, I think it's in uh, a church in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. So, but it is the most beautiful statement, which I, you know, from time to time will hand to my children mm -hmm. to remind them of what is important in life. It's just of what is important in life. And regarding careers, be proud of your career. There will always be people out there who are going to be, you know, much more accomplished or, you know, but be proud of what you can do. That's only a small part of it, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's a beautiful statement. If, mm -hmm. um, if you don't know it, go online, desiderata, and uh, it's so comforting and reassuring. Oh, yes. And we can strive towards balance. Maybe we're not going to get balance, no. but we certainly can be selective. No. No. Uh, yep. And comforted by this wonderful statement. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. You touched on the school in, in California with the suicide rate. Yes. It's not just California, as you know. It's oh, very much so. Very much so. Very much so. Right? Yeah. So, as parents, and you know, we're bringing, we're bringing up these soon to be high school students, and you're often, I often am challenged with. I'm not one of those pushing to be high achievers, but just sitting in a classroom where other people feel the vibe, the kids bring that home, and they think that's what we expect because they're friend and parent. That's right. That's so right. I try to give them coping skills, but I'm lost as to how to find the correct coping skills. I feel like even when we grew up, we didn't have the right coping skills. And oftentimes when they get to that age, you know, I wonder if they had better coping skills. Or how do we teach coping skills? Where do we start teaching that? Of course, in the home, but not just that. The communities in the school or in the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. Where do we begin, and mm -hmm. how do you deal with that in your, in your teaching? I guess there are a few things I would suggest. Uh, one being that we continue to let our children know what's important to us, and that that there is uh, that we have convictions about what is most important in life and that we can draw upon the, the, the Christian tradition for much of that, uh, but to, to let them know and to let them know over and over again what is truly important to us. So from a parenting perspective, I completely agree. That's yeah. my household. Yes. I'm thinking on a, like a, a larger level, mm -hmm. starting with our own communities, even in the schools. Mm -hmm. Just how do we get that out there to teach these kids how to cope and that suicide is not something that they should even contemplate that there's that's their only out there I feel like there's no other lessons of coping skills there's no mm -hmm. structure or even the idea of what it means to cope it's dismissive yeah. it's pushed away it's too painful to talk about there's just there's just this at least that's currently what I'm thinking of mm -hmm. I have some mm -hmm. friends that were raised out there in Palo Alto mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, where do the schools teach coping skills when they, they teach all the other pushing it into the Ivy Leagues and everything else? There's no responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've gotten ourselves into a pattern that uh, we go along. Um, we, we, we certainly uh, do not talk much about this because the fear is that talking about it will encourage others right. to mimic the suicide. Uh, and our pattern is that uh, we go blithely along until something tragic happens, and then we bring in the counselors for a period of time, and then they're gone. There's no options. It's either this or that. Yeah. Nobody says, well, if you, if you reach for that, 
great, because look at all you learned in there. If you don't achieve that, you're great too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not the message. No. And, um, you know, I, I think what we can do, uh, particularly in a, a, a public school environment, is to continue to press upon uh, the system the importance of uh, offering alternative models of achievement, um, to be mindful of the impact of that, and to, uh, as church communities, one of the things we can do is we offer a larger context for setbacks and disappointments. We have a theological grounding for that. It, it's part of the, what, what it means to be human. We have an unusual opportunity. We don't, can't obviously take that into the public schools. But we have that opportunity to be talking about how suffering uh, is not only a part of life, but oftentimes leads to redemption. And to be continuing to talk about that with young people as much as we possibly can. But for a big impersonal system, it can feel uh, like you don't have much way in. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just going to say, um, I, I think a lot of us when we're in the high achieving communities, um, like in, in our case, we have uh, all three of our kids are um, on a lot of travel teams and a lot yes. of travel teams now. Yep. My day, they would never have travel teams like on a Sunday morning yep. going up in Massachusetts. Yes. Um, yes. But now, you know, we as a family, I don't think anybody in this room would say they put sports ahead of spirituality, yep. but the yep. reality is sometimes what you know, you feel like you're a salmon swimming, you know, the wrong direction. That's right. Because once you make that team, then the practices, are, you know, you can't miss the games, and the games are on Sunday, whatever, you know, everybody has different yes. activities that their yep. children do. But um, could you talk a little bit about a process for just kind of approaching, um, deciding when too much is too much, and, and how to, um, things to think about when you're trying to, Say okay, all right. It's Christmas Day. We're not doing the game. It's it's you know Easter. It's, 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 it's too crazy. No, no. You know, to have like a little bit of a process to ask yourself some some signals that like you you know you're 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 to to decide when things are too much or to how you're feeling feeling like your spirituality is confronted with the pressures like uh, just an approach as parents with mm -hmm. some red flags that might be. Mm -hmm. This is not an all-encompassing answer, but uh, I think of a couple things. One is that we're, we as parents are in touch with our values and what uh, uh, we will accept and not accept. And in terms of involvement of things at the expense of something else, uh, we do from time to time have to make that difficult decision. And to say that, okay, you could be there, but you gotta be here. Um, the other thing is that, that young people are classic in taking on too much, particularly if they're high achievers. And uh, we've got to let them learn uh, the difficult experience of taking on too much and be there when they discover that and experience it. We cannot save them or rescue them from that experience. They've got to learn it themselves and we've got to be ready for it and be there for them when it happens. It's not a pleasant thing to see when it happens, obviously. But they've got to learn it that way. Are we? I think we need to close. Do okay. we have one last question? One last question. Who wants to have the last word here? <laughs> Can you talk about, or you touched on uh, allowing children and adults to experience failure to some extent. Can you talk about uh, coaching them or being with them afterwards to help them recognize what's going to inspire them to make sure they uh, get back on the correct path? I would, just from my experience, uh, crucial thing number one is we don't panic uh, because um, it is as easy as parents or teachers <clears throat> to panic at setbacks as it is for the young people. And in some cases, uh, we panic more than they do. So 
to be calm as much as we can, focused and not panicking <clears throat> at that experience. To take the time to talk about it. Okay, you've been through this, what have you learned? And to know that again, that's one of the most powerful learning experiences. That, uh, that failure or setback is not a forbidden word. Uh, and it is not something unacceptable because it's going to happen. And what does it tell us about what we've lived through? Uh, what do we learn from it? And how do we move on from there? And along with that is, all right, also when something like this happens again, because it will, uh, how are you going to be ready for it? But I, I don't think anything replaces the calm willingness to sit down with young people at one of the most learnable moments in their lives when they are really ready to think about things and to help them walk them through what happened. Thank you. Sorry we got in. Thank you. Thank you.